Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Communication satellites are ubiquitous. Everybody uses them, even if they don't realize. From the people that roll up in their RV with a Starlink antenna, to uh, get, stay in touch when they're in the middle of nowhere, to the people that just pick up the local newspaper and don't realize how much of it is compiled using connections that go via satellites. From backhaul to personal communication, satellites are everywhere. And I kind of thought it would be good to actually do a sort of technical history explaining how the satellites we have today have developed and you know how the original ideas were conceived. Now, obviously, these days, Starlink is the biggest game in town. It is throwing up more satellites than anyone else and sort of by extension, almost more bandwidth than, than anyone else. But, you know, 10 years ago, the majority of the communication was happening by, by uh, you know, geostationary satellites. And if you want to look at the history of satellites, you have to go back to the 1940s. So the 1940s, of course, we had World War II and all that. But at that technology, that level, or sorry, at that time, the technology for worldwide communication was still pretty limited. You had telegraph lines that could, uh, in some cases, carry telephone communications. But at the time, they hadn't got the ability to send a phone signal under the Atlantic across such great distances. As early as 1927, it was in fact possible to make telephone calls across the Atlantic. They carefully picked the radio frequencies used so that they would bounce between the ionosphere and the surface and hopefully get across the Atlantic. They would actually have to change the frequencies depending upon the time of day or the season or whether the sun had spots. And it, there weren't many circuits available. You pretty much had to book your telephone call a long time in advance and then make sure the other party was ready to pick up at the same time. So you'd probably have to send them a telegram. Point is, these uh, reflection systems based on the ionosphere were very limited in the number of circuits they could carry and certainly couldn't sustain the needs of a modern society. But yes, in the mid-1940s, Arthur C. Clarke, famously wrote an article in Wireless World talking about extraterrestrial relays. This was the idea of having space stations which could relay communications. Now, the space stations that he talked about, they weren't like the satellites that we see in geostationary orbit today. They were much larger. These were huge stations with crews that would be there to repair and operate things. Think of them as like telephone exchanges. After all, if something breaks on your spacecraft, you want somebody on hand to be able to fix this. And what, of course, one of the things that he did was he looked at the orbital mechanics and he pointed out that if you orbited a spacecraft at exactly the right altitude, its orbital period would be 23 hours, 56 minutes, one sidereal day. It would match up with the rotation of the Earth and therefore would appear to be stationary over that point in the Earth, hence the term geostationary, which for a long time, geostationary orbit, I would hear regularly hear people refer to it as Clark orbit to sort of, you know, uh, respect the individual who came up with this concept. He uh, didn't just figure out the orbit. He looked at, uh, you know, the rocket performance that would be needed. And he said that it was logical that this would be reached. He talked about the solar power, the battery system, eclipses, which would happen around the equinoxes and the transmitters. And he did some basic calculations to show that the amount of power needed to transmit to the world wasn't huge. It was well within the capabilities of uh, the systems that existed. He actually talked about solar power before like the modern uh, you know, solar cells existed. This was back then it was a uh, you know, solar collectors heating water in a pressure chamber that would uh, boil and uh, that would then drive a turbine. <laughs> you know, that was the technology that existed back then. He also talked about the antennas having specific footprints where you could put a spotlight on one country and a different spotlight on another country and have you know, different frequencies for these regions so that they could get individualized service. This was a concept that obviously applies to modern satellites. Now, all of this stuff sounds like a pretty cool idea. He didn't patent the idea, however, because, uh, well, he didn't actually have an ability to do any of this himself. It was merely him musing as a science fiction author. The technology to actually do this was far out of his hands. Um, I mean, I'm not sure whether it would have helped him eventually, but, uh, you know, 20 years later, there were geostationary communication satellites. So, yeah, it turns out, however, around the same time, 
there were people that were actually sending commu or demonstrating communication was possible via a satellite. They were bouncing signals off a satellite. And of course, in the 1940s, before the space program got going, the only satellite around Earth was the moon. And radio engineers had figured out that it was in fact possible to bounce signals off the moon, but uh, turning that into a useful application would take some time. Initially, they were interested in this because they could look at the ionosphere, they could show that signals actually penetrated the ion ionosphere. So there was a guy in the US Navy named James Trexler, and he heard about the idea of lunar relay, and he came up with a, an altogether more insidious use for it. He thought that since it would reflect radio signals intentionally transmitted at it, it might also reflect radio signals which were unintentionally sent that way, which means basically any radio signal sent from the Earth. He thought that you could build a large antenna, point it at the moon, and use it to eavesdrop on Soviet communications. So that actually got the US government very interested. And he began working on this, making regular observations of the moon in the late 1940s. He started out with the old Nazi antennas and uh, began eventually commissioning their own specific hardware for this project, for the Passive Moon Relay project. Uh, eventually they figured out that they would need a 600 foot antenna and at some point this caused the project to slow down, but people were still very much interested in active communications. One of the problems with the active communication side of things is, and this would be true for any reflection, is that the moon is an extended object, it's a sphere, and the signal that would arrive at the moon would hit the leading edge first and then you know, further round it would hit it later. So you would have a dispersion in the timing of the signal which would make the signal recovery kind of hard to figure out. But if you use a narrow enough antenna you might be able to uh, you know, get rid of this. So anyway, they had this antenna in Stump Neck, Maryland and by the mid-1950s they were sending teletype signals all the way to Hawaii. The US Air Force was also interested in this, by the way, for sending signals to bombers which might be over the horizon. But uh, the system did actually end up getting used well into the 60s for uh, a completely different group. The, the NSA, I guess, that would be the one, the National Security Agency, they were very interested in operating signals gathering ships around the world. And so these were old, like, Liberty ships, which uh, were built in World War II. They were converted to carry a whole bunch of observation equipment, and they needed a way to communicate back to back home. And so they gave them these, like, 20-foot antennas, which were gyroscopically stabilized, and they could send the signals, bounce them off the moon, and they could be received at antennas around the world. In addition to Maryland and Hawaii, they got agreements to put an antenna in Sobe in Okinawa, Japan, and in, I think, a village Oakdale or something in uh, the UK. And so they could continuously communicate their uh, signals gathering from all around the world. And they did this into the 1960s. I'm not sure how far into the 1960s, but by this point, of course, actual artificial satellites had become available. And that technology was radically different. So. The first actual communications, the first satellite that was intended to communicate was a spacecraft called SCORE. And this was launched in Christmas, just before Christmas, 1958. It was an Atlas rocket, very early version of it. And they didn't so much uh, have a satellite placed on top of it as convert the entire Atlas booster into the satellite with antenna running down the racetracks on the side of the spacecraft and a transmitter mission and recording system. This was a store and forward communication satellite. So you, when it flew near a base station, the base station could connect to it, uh, send up data to it, which would be recorded onto tape, and then it could be commanded to replay that data at other times. And so this was used mostly for, you know, PR propaganda purposes, where they set up a speech of Eisenhower you know, professing you know, peace on Earth. It's Christmas, you know, we, <laughs> right? Of course, this was being uh, played out on shortwave from a missile which was designed to lob nuclear warheads around the world. But uh, yeah, you know, space is a bit like that. So yeah, SCORE actually flew around the Earth transmitting for a few weeks before its batteries ran out. And the store and forward concept would be, it would be worked on further. There was another spacecraft called Courier 1B, uh, 
which could send thousands of words of teletype per hour um, it could or per minute. So it could be sending like a teletype signals down to the ground. I think it could carry voice signals. It could also carry fax images. So this worked for a few weeks when they sent it up. They demonstrated its ability to send teletype to various locations around the world. And unfortunately it stopped after a few weeks, but apparently it was still alive. It's thought that what happened was the uh, onboard command encryption system got out of sync with the ground and they were keyed based on the time. And so when they were out of sync, they couldn't talk to each other and they couldn't figure out how to get resynchronized. So those were store and forward satellites. What we think of as real-time communication satellites really began in 1960 with Project Echo. And again, they started out with passive reflection. Project Echo was a large metalized sphere, a balloon which would inflate in orbit. And it would not have any onboard guidance or electronics. It was merely a large reflector that could take a signal from one part of the planet and reflect it so it could be received by another part of the planet. And this actually worked. <laughs> I, I did a whole video where I visited uh, the antenna in Homedale, New Jersey, uh, the same antenna that was used to discover the black body radiation of the Big Bang. But uh, this, the problem of course with this is that it requires a very powerful transmitter, a very large and sensitive receiver at the other end, and both of them need to steer pretty quickly to be able to track an object that is in a relatively low orbit moving at a you know degree or so per second so these were quite complicated to set up and quite complicated to plan but they did demonstrate real-time reflection communication and they were able to really um, like telephone calls between the coasts using this mechanism also around the same time was a rather less well-received project called uh, project west ford so, as I mentioned, shortwave radio, you can reflect off the ionosphere and sometimes get better, you know, disc ranges on it. Well, the US military thought, well, how about we just create a more dense ionosphere higher up? And they did this by sending up tiny copper wires, which were tuned to like a certain you know, gigahertz frequency. And they just let millions of these out. So they would form a cloud of copper wires at around 3,500 kilometers up. And the idea was, yeah, you could simply reflect your radio transmissions off this if you knew it was there. And unfortunately, a lot of people knew it was there and they were really unhappy with the idea of throwing millions of pieces of space debris up there because these things, of course, as, as much as they are light and would deorbit relatively quickly, they would still do some nasty stuff to satellites if they hit them. So Project West Ford would only really operate for three launches from 1961 to 1963. And yeah, it wasn't very popular with anyone else. And indeed, some of the complaints led to language being included in the Outer Space Treaty to make sure that uh, people operating in space didn't uh, cause too much trouble to other potential uh, users of space. But that wouldn't, of course, have stopped the military from doing what they wanted. The real thing that stopped the military from continuing with Project West Ford after stopping, you know, solving all their problems was the fact that uh, some boffins had figured out a better way to do satellite communication using an active repeater system. That was, of course, Telstar 1, a satellite that got so famous they made music about it. And we're going to talk about that in the next episode. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.